How are you doing? Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank ZBrush and uh, ZBrush Summit, Paul and the crew, for giving me this uh, platform. This is an amazing opportunity to show some, uh, what I think is cool work anyway, um, on a bigger scale. Um, what I do is toy design, uh, product development, a lot different from gaming and what some of the guys bring to the, bring to the whole entire uh, thing here, the whole, the whole show, but uh, it's, it's, it's also a huge niche in what ZBrush is about. You know, ZBrush is available for so many different things and so many different, uh, pro not, not just products, but movies. It, 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 it's, it's everywhere now, so this is just my little thing that I do, and I want to give you a little, little taste of it, okay? And uh, up here, as you say, it's the art of toy design, but I'm, I only got like a s small amount of time, like an hour, so I'm going to focus on what I think kind of made me stand out, and that would be my uh, presentation, presentation, realistic modeling uh, of, of action figures, and the, the idea that someone would see an image and not know if it's something you can hold in your hand, if it's a viable physical object, or if it's something that's, you know, fully rendered. You know, the biggest compliment I can get from this work is when somebody says, hey, where is this available? I want to order it right now. But honestly, these are only um, digital images, dim digital, it's all digital, you know? And, and it's about my rendering and it's about my process and that's what I want to share with you guys a little bit today. So I'm gonna sit down real quick here, okay. So uh, starting out, I was a fan just like many of you guys, you know, here today of the many subjects that we all know and love. You know, I was a typical 80s kid, 80s growing up with uh, all that fanboyism that, that built into us. That, that's why this is such a thing, because all the amazing things we grew up with, you know? Uh, I also was a big fan of toys, and I never grew out of it. I never grew out of it, and I, I'm sure there's many of you that never grew out of it as well. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, so, so big ups to that weird guy you see standing in the, in the you know, action figure aisle, because that's me, I've seen you, we've seen each other, you know what I mean? <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, I, I was, I was a, not, not, not an odd kid, but I would look at my toys a little bit differently. Instead of sitting there, you know, playing with them and doing what a lot of normal kids would do and messing them up, I would take care of my toys. I would sit there and put them on my little desk by my, by my bed. My mother was like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm putting them in poses and I want them to, I was looking at the toys differently. And what I didn't realize was I was admiring the beauty of it, you know, early on. We were, you know, we look at this and, and, and so that's what I was kind of doing. I was, I was a collector at eight years old and I didn't even know it, you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, it was, it was a huge part of, of my process of learning what I was going to be doing in the future, you know, obviously a lot of different, I was pulled in a lot of different directions as a young kid, like all of us, uh, whether it be 2D, you start in 2D and then you, you kind of fetch your way through and then realize, you know, I think I was 17 or 18 and then I picked up some polymer clay and I had it in my hand, man. And it was just like, whoa, wait a second. I think I may be way better at this than I ever was in 2D. Cause I was by, you know, I was sitting there drawing my Spider-Mans, I was drawing my Captain Americas cause I thought I was gonna grow up and be the next big Jim Lee or George Perez, you know, with my little portfolio under my arm, all that kind of stuff. I, we all had those visions, you know, of doing something great and being inspired by somebody. But it was, you know, I was drawn to 3D because I just felt that it was a better niche for me. So I started out, uh, traditional sculpting, you know, and I was looking for ways of getting into toy design by doing traditional sculpting. And uh, I, I was down in an area in Indiana, close to Kentucky, where there was a hotbed of a place called Wonderfest, which Wonderfest is a garage kit show. And 
I saw these guys doing these amazing works and statues and, and stuff like that. And this is before, this is before high-end collectibles was really a major thing. Because high-end collectibles, you know, it's, it's everything now. You know, you get, you get your final finished piece. It's beautiful. And they are works of art, man. They're works of art. You got your sideshow. You got your general giants. You got pop culture shock. You got these amazing guys that are making amazing product that's out there, right? Uh, but before that, you, you would only be able to, your limits was really what um, the Hasbros and the Mattels were offering you of the world. And they, 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 had their, they had their strengths and their weaknesses, but they're still amazing products nonetheless. But the garage kit community, you had these artists, man. They were out in their garages, I get the garage kit, right? And they were just cranking out some of the most amazing sculptures and, and stuff like that. And then a lot of these guys that I got to know moved on to doing actual product development for companies, you know. They, they cut their teeth in wax and, and resin and, uh, and, and molding and casting and making these things, you know. I met a lot of good friends through that community. And, you know, even painters, a lot of guys that were doing painting in that went on to become prototype painters for what they do now, so, you know. Um, I'll keep moving on. Sorry about being long-winded. I don't have another guy here to bounce the things back off, so if I start to rant, I apologize. But I, you know, just got a lot to say here, and I'm trying to get it in really quickly. One year at Wonderfest, I met a guy, and I went by a booth, and he was sitting at a table. His name was Mo Flint. Yeah, you know who Mo Flint is. Anyway, um, Mo was sitting there, and he had this poster on the table. And it said, looking for traditional guys to learn to do toy design, right? I'm like, yeah, this is me. I'm going to get in there. I'm going to make some toys, you know, it's actual real work. But at the bottom of it, it said uh, toy design, but it said tr willing to train digital, you know. And that's what brings us all here today. It's digital, uh, digital art. And a, a lot back then, a lot of guys kind of turned their noses up at it because they just didn't see the connection in the art of what we can do with a computer versus what we do with our hands. And honestly, that's a subject that is still debated today, right? Uh, but at the same time, it's, a, it, it's all art at the end of the day. What you make on a screen, what you make, it's just another tool, just another tool. ZBrush is just another tool to somebody who has mad skills. You know, and there's a lot of people out there that got some crazy mad skills these days, right? So, yeah, that's, that, that's just the point. It's, it's about being passionate about what we do. Um, and, and the one thing that I will say about when I went to digital, because I met Mo and I went to Chicago and I got a job and I'm still to this day working with this company and making toys and I love it, but digitally, it's faster, it's more efficient. This is my opinion. Faster and more efficient, and then also, I don't get any more exacto cuts on my hand. I'm not smelling the dust, I'm not doing any of that, because you know I keep clean. I also call it, there's a difference, I call it um, blue collar sculpting, and then you got your white collar sculpting, right? <laughs> You got you guys that are, you know, more nitty and gritty, and they get in there, and they're working with their hands, a blue collar, you know, and there's nothing wrong. Hey, you know, give me a beer. I'm going to drink this and sculpt away, you know, or, you know, more artsy. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call them all like that. But and then you got your white collar guys that sit behind the screen, and the worst thing you got to worry about is getting a little mustard on your shirt while you're eating your sandwich, right? <laughs> Stuff like that. So to me, that's great, because look, Ma, I ain't got any more exacto cuts on my hands. Yeah, that's, that's a great thing. I hold my pen, I might get a little cramp every once in a while, but I can, I can sit there and work through that for sure. Okay, so moving on. Let's, let's, let's get to what, I, what, what I'm talking about today. Honestly, this, what you see up here, is what I've done in my own time, and this is what I'm going to share, share to you about. It's, it's personal sculpting. It's personal work but it's something I was passionate about and that drove me to just create every single day, every single night, putting a little bit of time in at the end of my day job, you know? It's like, you're okay, you've already gotten to the industry or you're doing something, and sometimes you feel like you could do a little bit more to push yourself to another level. And that's what I wanna to discuss today about the passion and about the joy of continuing to work. Because seriously, man, I did this stuff in, I did a lot of these in the last 
I would say two years, and I was cranking out one after one, and they're like, Where, when do you sleep? What, what are you doing, man? You know, I'm like, I'm just being, it's a game to me. It became a game. You know, I, you, know you got a lot of gamers, right? Obviously, a lot of gamers here. And uh, you can sit there and, and, and game away, or you can create, and it can become a game to you, and you're like seeing how far you can push yourself to that next level, you know? And that's what I enjoy about it so much. You know, because you keep pushing and you keep pushing. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. So, I'm going to hop on over to this seat and start switching over. So, hopefully, I'll peek around and you see my head a little bit. Um, what I said was, I went to Chicago and then I got into a business of creating for a company called Creata. And what Creata does is creates uh, McDonald's Happy Meal toys, right? Millions upon millions of these toys. They're huge. They're everywhere. Uh, I, I, I like to look at it this way. If, if you've got a kid between the ages of 5 and 15, at some point, because I've been doing this the last eight years of my life, at some point they've had one of those little toys in their hand, and I work with an amazing team of developers and designers, and the great thing is, at some point, one of your kids have had that in their hand, and I, you know, I'm at peace with that. It, it's, it's a great feeling to know that I had a, a part of that because McDonald's is actually a really huge business. Uh, let's see, I have some, I have some numbers here. Uh, three to eight million units per toy design. And that's just in the United States. Globally, even bigger. Three to eight million units. It's a lot of toy. But the problem is you also got to worry about all the different things that come with these toys. Uh, let's see, safety. Safety is huge. It's, it's, it's a huge thing with this. The high safety restrictions. Um, also, they always have to keep the costs very low. So this isn't high-end work. It's not glamorous. Yeah, I get to work with a lot of licensors and a lot of different companies and a lot of movie companies as well which is great, and you get to see the good side, the ugly side, the beautiful side, all the different sides, but at the same time, there's a lot of restrictions with what I'm doing, a deco count even. You know, you pick it up and you're like, ah, it's just a Happy Meal toy, it's only, it looks blah. No, uh, you have maybe four or five decos maximum, you know, on, on a toy like this, but you try to do your best because this is the industry that you're in, it's commercial design. It's not an artist-driven design. You can't project yourself onto a, 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 an actual product and say, no, this is my way, because you're doing it their way. And this, this relates to not just toys, this doesn't relate to just product development, it's the movie industry, it's the gaming industry, it's any industry. If it's not your work, then you're doing the best job you can to make the client or make, the, make your company happy, you know. And that's where I kind of, I'm, I'm going to speed through a few more of these simple little designs. That's where I kind of uh, decided at the end of my day that I wanted to kind of do something for myself, you know? Uh, Hello Kitty, a, a, lot, a, lot of different, a lot of different items here. What I started to do was realize I wanted to start creating for myself and start making some things and, you know, have some fun with it. So I have some four basic philosophies for creating your own... Um, Personal work in general, personal work, stuff that you, know, that, that you can have a passion about and stuff you can do. And the, the number one is to stand out, right? And I'm going I'm to just go through these. Stand out, style, do what works for you, and enjoy, right? And if you wanted to stand out and you were doing ZBrush, there's a certain place called ZBrushCentral.com, right? ZBrushCentral.com. And if you've ever been to ZBrush, I don't know who's been there, but I think everybody has. Yeah, you've been there? Yeah, you've been there. You've been there before. You've been there? Okay. Yeah, if you look up there at the top row, right? Top row. Top row is where you will see the most amazing, outstanding, astonishing pieces of works of art from every, st every single viable way of, of working in ZBrush. It, it, it's amazing stuff. Stuff that evokes passion, stuff that evokes you to be better at what you do, stuff that's just downright humbling. You see this, and you know, I, I go through this 
on the, you know, sometimes every other day, sometimes weekly, but I have to check it out because it drives me to be better and drives me to what, what I want to do. And that's what standing out is about. All these people that you see up here found a way, their own way of standing out. So that's what we need to focus on as being creatives ourselves and working with our own personal work. We want to try to stand out. Say, for instance, there's a Wolverine, right? You know, just you, you go up there and you see this amazing, like I'm, I'm a huge comic book head, so there's, a, there's this amazing gnarly Wolverine and he's clinching and he's got claws out, you know, hair flowing back, right? He's got some, you know, a little bit of food, food in his teeth, stuff like that, but it's hyper-realistic, most amazing Wolverine you've ever seen. But you're this guy just now starting cutting his teeth in ZBrush and you're like, I got to get noticed like this guy that just did this Wolverine. This is just simply amazing. Well, are you going to copy that and do the same exact Wolverine? Are you going to put a little spin on it, change it up, and make it your own? That's where style comes in. That's one thing you could do. You can change up the style to make something your own. That Wolverine, you can kind of uh, develop it and hone it into your own thing. Don't go out there and do the same ultra-realistic thing you just saw, because honestly, when you put it up against that, even if you're better than the guy that you just saw the, the work from, you might be 10 times better, but now there's two, right? And when you're looking at one and two, it's kind of like which one's better, and then one's kind of just kind of like fade away a little bit, right? And you don't want to be that guy. So change it up and stand out in a different way. So style, style's going to be the way to do that. You give them some your own personal twist, personal style. Um, let me go ahead here. Sorry, I do have notes because I was trying to stay in order with what I'm talking about. Um, and then we are going to get to a few questions. I'm not going to just run out and not not give you guys time to say something. And also, I will actually open up a model. <laughs> okay, with personal style, one thing I will say is, if you don't have one, take what you're into. Take what you're passionate about. Personal style, you can, you can look into the great big world of inspiration, and you can pick, right, from each one of these little things that you're into, whether it be something like, Wallace and Gromit, which is more of a, you know, claymation style, or Bruce Timm, Batman animated series, clean, swift, hard edges, you know what I'm talking about, Bat, you know, it's amazing work, right? Frazetta, Frazetta in his paintings, just Tim Burton in his quirky style, you take little bits, you take all those little bits, and you just dump it into a great big bowl, and you start mixing that bowl up, right, right. wait, I, I mix like this, I'll change it up, so you mix it like that, and then you dump that out, and you got something for yourself. And then everybody's gonna say, well, I see a little bit of this and that and this and that uh, from them, but it's not stealing, it's just, it's, it's, it's a continual process. Even these guys that I just mentioned, they were all inspired by somebody else. Inspiration comes from inspiration, comes from inspiration, comes from inspiration, so on and so on, et cetera. You know, everybody's inspired by somebody, and you can see little elements of people's stuff. So that's what I have to say about style. The next one is do what works for you. And this is what makes ZBrush so powerful, right? ZBrush is totally freeing now. Maybe back in ZBrush 2.0, not so much, you know, but ZBrush, ZBrush now, there's so many roads you can take. So many roads you can take to get to where you want to be. Matter of fact, it's downright astonishing what you can do because you got your Z spheres, you got your Z remesher, you got your Dynamesh, you got your Z modeler, right? And all these roads are ways you can take to get to where you want to be, and there's no wrong way now. There's no wrong way to create a model. You know, I mean, you do have your certain restrictions based on what your structures are and what you're doing, but you can always find your way back with ZBrush. You can dynamesh, and then, then you can remesh, and then you, you know, and so on and so forth. So you can bounce around. You can go old school and Z-sphere the whole bad boy, and then go in there. There's no wrong thing. It's, it's, it's how your end product is. You know, it's your end product. And also, say, if, if you're in the gaming industry and you have to have your, you know, I, I understand that, um, which is another thing I do want to touch on. Uh, what I do with production, with, with product development models, it's like taking a gaming model and flipping it on its head. Because you have the ability to go in there and 
and uh, just kind of just scope free. You got to, you know, you can take Jack up all your resolution all the way to the moon. But then when it comes to getting to a point where you want to print your items, you just go ahead in and uh, decimate the model to a, a, a lot lower of a level. Um, anyway, so that's getting off that point. I can say a little bit about that when I get into the, the demo here. Uh, the next one is the enjoy, because if you're trying to get to a certain point to be in the industry in some way, shape, or form, you want to be able to enjoy what you're doing if it's a hobby. So you want to find a subject that you're passionate about and just go insane and go crazy with it, right? So here's a few of my basic designs that I decided to start making on my own. They're very caricature-like, uh, a stylization, hard edge. I like that, you know, I was inspired by a lot of different people's works out there. You know, you can see some of the influences. I don't have to go in and tell you who, but you can, you can, you can see a lot of it. And uh, another thing that I kind of wanted to push the limits of was the ability of working with ZBrush and KeyShot together with the KeyShot Bridge. There's a lot you can do. You don't have to go out and get KeyShot Pro even. You don't need Pro for what I just did. All this stuff, you can do just as well in the bridge. And it's, it's very affordable, very cheap. Plug, plug, key shot, whatever. <laughs> okay, so I was able to take these and make them like you would hold them in your hand. And uh, that's, that's what I wanted. That was the final render I wanted. Uh, now, do you do a lot of sound effects when you're doing these? What's that? Do you make a lot of sound effects when you're sculpting these? When, yeah, bam, bam. No, a lot of times, and I know all y'all are this way too, when you're like working on a certain uh, licensed character or a certain just element anyway, you hear that song in your head and it won't go away. You know, some guys even go as far as playing the soundtrack, you know. If you're doing Batman and you're, you're playing the old school, da 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 you know what I mean? da 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 And then you're sleeping at night, you're just like, da-da-da-da-da-da-da, right? It just won't go away. I was enjoying every minute of what I was doing. I'd go home, and it was, it was just, I, I, I got to sit down, I got to sit down, I got to create, I got to create, I got to make something, right? What am I going to do this week? Ooh, ooh, so many subjects to pick from. Uh... I act like I was my own toy company. I was like, I'm my own toy company, la, la, la. Guess what? My budget is a bazillion dollars. I, can, I have no restrictions on any, anything, anything. My tooling, yeah, bazillion, right? Budgets, I, out the window, right? You can do that. It's your own little fantasy land. That's a great thing about ZBrush. You can do that. You can pretend and stuff. And if you get noticed and you get some of this stuff out there and people like it, you know, make sure, oh, look at this perfect timing. Makes your heart beat. <laughs> right? Uh, so I'm having fun, and that's all I was doing. And then it, it caught a few eyes, and that's why I'm sitting here today. Uh, I planned it out like I would have additional hands and additional weaponry, you know, and I could be like, oh, no. If, if somebody told me, oh, how does that, does that, you know, knife come out of his hand? I was like, no, it's in an actual hand. You just unplug it and put it in, you know, and I made all the joints that way you know, with, 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 with what I was doing. So, like I said, no, no budgets, uh, no deco, deco counts, I will say. You know, all the, as many decos as I wanted to. Honestly, you know, if, if I sent this stuff to China, they'd come back just, just, with, just crying, literally, <laughs> over some of this stuff that I'm, I'm doing here, you know, especially with that gene detail. They're like, what, what are you talking about, man? That's going to cost a lot of money. I'm like, doesn't matter. I got a bazillion dollars. Anyway. Okay. So, another thing about art is it can help you work through things. It can help you work, you know, if you're feeling blue or something like that, just sit down and just go, man. Great. And, and you know, music, be inspired by, all, you know, music inspires you, art can inspire you as well to, to create. Uh, there you go, everybody had to do their take right, so what, whatever. <laughs> Classic Elvis. Actually, in Keyshot, I assigned all the colors in gray, but you can't tell that because I didn't put any color here, so it just looks like it dumped it into Photoshop and and uh, just, ran, you know, made it great. But there we go, Randy Macho Man Savage, oh yeah, you know. I'm a huge wrestling fan. I, I'm proud of it, and I'll admit it to anybody. Uh, oh yeah, brother, dig it, oh, you know. <laughs> it's just an amazing thing. So I, I love that kind of stuff. You know, it might be quirky. Some people get it. It's like, it's like wrestling's like NASCAR. You either get it or you don't. <laughs> That's how I look at it. 
You know, these guys are just going in circles to me. But for wrestling, I get it. And there's theory and, and, and actual brains behind it. It's a soap opera for men, but whatever. Okay. And then, yeah, there's Carl. I'll just keep going. <laughs> Moving forward, yeah, I had to do my version of Carl, Stone Cold Steve Austin, stuff like that. But like I said, there's, it, it can, <laughs> it, 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 Tyson, yeah, I, I don't want to even try to do my impression of him. But uh, once in a while, you know, this might seem like a random one for you, but this was me working something out. You know, I was driving home on a Monday from work, and then I heard on the news, you know, I was driving, and, and then they were sitting there saying, uh, you know, Robin Williams had died. And I, you know, I was like, it just, it's like a punch in my stomach, man. You know, I was like, I, lo I just loved his body of work so much. So I, I just wasn't hungry. I didn't eat. I just went home. I sat at my computer. It was like 6.30. And by the end of the night, it was like midnight, one o'clock. I was sitting there at this render and it made me smile, you know, uh, put a smile on my face because it was me just working through something on how I felt. And that's what art is about. You know, how you feel, it's the feelings inside that evoke the passion to make you create something tangible. And that's what I kind of did there, you know, enough, enough about the sop, sappy, whatever. <laughs> Let's keep going. <laughs> All right, so there's a David Grohl in key, and not key shot, but just rendered in, in ZBrush really quickly. You know, my stylization, I kind of go in there and hit a lot of hard lines and stuff like that. Let's actually get into a model. I apologize. What I do typically for these is I build up my own parts library, you know. With a toy company, a lot of times you will receive, um, you can sometimes receive an actual buck for them, a buck which is a figure or, and what it does is it keeps it within, keeps it true, keeps it within proportions of what you're, what you're doing and what you're working on and you can work off of that. It's not cheating. They're giving you something to develop the product and keep it more correct. Same thing would apply with uh, digital assets from a movie company where you get this, you know, you all know this guy and he's like, uh, dead pen, like deer, deer in headlights. For me, I can still work with that because it's a, it, it's a physical representation. The silhouette is there, everything's there, but honestly, it's reverse engineering that model. I have to go in there and make solids of everything. I work in solids, yo. Solid, 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 solid. You know, you see this piece here, this torso, solid. Sorry, there's a little ding in there, not perfect, but is what it is. And you know, I did not go in there and split it and core it, but I could have, you know, but for this purpose, you know, it's, it's where it needs to be on this, uh, this basic physical buck. I have short bucks, small bucks, tall bucks, any size buck, man, I can get you a buck, you know, right? <laughs> Hands in the same thing, you know? It increased my speed. That's why I was able to knock out so many of these bad boys, because I have multiple arms, multiple legs, multiple hands, and I'm able to quickly, you know, just bring one together and then work on the details. And that hasn't changed from old school theory, old school traditional sculptors. Guys like Tim Bruckner, who's an amazing, amazing artist, would typically take a, he had a mold, or not a mold, it, yeah, a, a rubber silicone mold of a, of a figure buck, and then he would pour the wax in there, right? Pop that bad boy open, pull the wax out, he's already got his buck, and then he would start. That, he did that on a lot of his action figure work. I wouldn't say that about the statues that he did, but a lot of action figures, because it's a quicker process. It's a way of speeding things up quite a bit. Okay, let's keep moving here. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Sorry about that. Let me get this back up here. I want to show you something. I want to open up uh, this guy here. Right? The Nature Boy. And as you see here, Nature Boy has been painted in poly paints, right? I got the poly paints going on. He's got his flamboyant. He's got his chest out. He is proud of his title, and he's styling and profiling. Okay, so quickly... I was, when I started out, I was painting in poly paint and then dropping it into Keyshot Bridge, you know, like a lot of people do. And the beautiful thing about Keyshot is you get this beautiful render right off the bat. And you're like, whoa, that's it, man, I'm done. Or are you done? Right? You can take a little further if you want, you know, or you can be done with this. 
to some people, this is perfect. This is exactly what you need. This is, you know, it's more, I would call this more of a 2D, 3D look. You know, you can't really go in there and grab it, so to speak. So I went in there and tweaked my formula a little bit, but I did it on the key shot end, and I'm going to get into that. But here's what I ended up coming up with. So it's night and day for what I need to do. What you need to do might be totally different, but for what I need to do, this works for me. Um, there's a side-by-side -side comparison of the two. Like I said, I'm only going to hit this presentational factor of toy design. Joe Minna is right around the corner putting on a, going to church on school right now, <laughs> you know what I mean? He's sitting there telling everybody how you make your bouillons, how you do this and that. And honestly, a lot of that stuff you can find online and you know, but I didn't have time to squeeze it into one hour. So I'm kind of just focusing on one aspect of what I do and what kind of brought me here today, and that's my presentation. Um, really quick, I don't have this pulled up, so I'm going to have to go into this folder. I apologize. Uh, I forgot to play this. Here's how I would rough out a head quickly. And yeah, you saw it was Finn. I do more of a stylized approach um, is what it is. This isn't the first time we've had toy design at Zebra Summit. You know, we, we've, we've had Shane and Matt from Disney Infinity the other year. Amazing, amazing panel, you know. It was, it was great. It was great. So, see what they did, and I, I love that style. So, I was just like, uh, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> I won't do that again. Special effects. Okay, we got it back. Okay, my bad. Um, and then also, oh, Sideshow guys, man. That was a great set of guys that were in here. You know, the, the crew, they were doing their thing. And I really enjoyed that. I've been working with uh, sculptors in house for the last like eight years. And the cool thing is we get to bounce off of each other ideas and, and bounce off of each other. When you're at home alone, you don't get that interaction as much, but I've learned a lot from other guys. Matter of fact, I didn't even really start in ZBrush. I actually cut my teeth in, um, in a program called Freeform, which is more design-based and it's more about engineering and stuff like that. So I got to learn a lot of the engineering of toys. It wasn't until a buddy of mine named George Helmick came in and he was like, oh man, all I do is just work in ZBrush, man. I don't know any of the other program. And then I saw what he was doing and I saw the level of how he was just able to just stay in that program, which pushed me to, to be like, I'm going home, I'm working in ZBrush, I'm staying in here and I'm gonna get it done and crank through it, right? So that's kind of what I do as far as uh, creating. I'm sorry, it's tedious a little bit with the whole hair design, but I work in solids. I gotta work in solids. I cannot cut something and then look through and then see that phantom zone of emptiness, you know, with a model. And it just drives me crazy. Or I have my custom UI set up where I will go in there. I'm gonna pause it right here. Okay, I think that's where it's ending. But I will hit double just to get that double-sided wall. So that, you know, that's my little fin head. Did that loop? Did that go through twice or once? Oh, good. I'm on, I'm on time. There we go. All right. Okay, so that's kind of how I would work out a, a, a head sculpt, you know. Honestly, that's like uh, the head sculpt itself is probably 60% of my work when it comes to those stylized pieces. Um, one thing that I noticed when I started to get um, more work was I didn't have a lot of time to invest in uh, these, these guys because... Once I started doing this, I start, my phone started ringing, you know? Uh, old school phone, no. <laughs> old school, hello? Uh, no, I get, my old school phone started ringing and I got some work, so it limited my time even more. So I'm doing my full-time job, I'm trying to still stay passionate, so I started to dabble and develop another style. And it was more of a cutesy style, it was more of what I was into at the time, and there's no doubt, you know, I, I'm a fan of a lot of Irvin Vinyl, a lot of the Funko stuff that's out there, a lot of the many different things that are out there, but I was like playing around and, you know, everybody did their, their version of Stranger Things at this point. It's just like a sensation phenomenon and, you know, I had to do my take. Uh, but yeah, I started working with this little style here and I, you know, I call them Creation Crib, or like Criblets or whatever, you know, my own fun little name. Uh, with the heads, they're Charlie Brown-like, yeah, but I was trying to feed in some of the expression of the actual likeness of the person into them. And that's where I've kind of went right now. Yeah, 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 
is what it is. You know, it's, it's, I was playing out an actual scene. This is fiction. It all happened on the show, so it is what it is. You know, it's, it's okay. It's cute. It's still cute. Okay. <laughs> Tell your mom that, right? Uh, you know, uh, yeah, that, that was a little piece. I, I, another one of those moments where you're like, er, I got to go home and work out my emotions. Eh. But, you know, I went home and I made this guy in like one evening and it was a fun little tribute. And uh, I'll leave that at that. When I started out doing this style, I started out with these, uh, these four guys. And as you, if you notice from the first two, which I did was Luke and Leia. Luke and Leia basically have a, a more generic face. And that was before I got to Han, baby. And I'm like, I can't do Han the same. I can't sit there and go in there to give him a grin and be done with it. No, Han has way too much swagger, way too much expression, way too much cockiness to be treated that way. And then that's when I went in and noticed I could really evolve with it and take it to another level. And there's nothing wrong when you're developing something. You might have your own set standards in your head and rules that you go by. But if it's for you, break those rules and then test something out. Try something new that's going to possibly push it to the next level. You know, I, at first I also had all the arms straight down and, and then I, I decided to break symmetry one night. Uh, that's, that, what, what, what happened there? I will explain that. That was, that was me on a Friday night with a couple too many beers and I thought it was funny. And that's what I ended up at the end of the night. And I was like, oh, that'd be rad, man. Let's just do this. Pop them colors. Is what it is. I just threw it in there, show. <laughs> All right. So we got the Heisenbergs and the stuff of the world. And then the John Snows. Um, one technique that I'm going to explain that I do here is when I go into Keyshot, I split everything up into their own subtools. Uh, so... All of these colors are broken down into individual subtools. So, the, so what you see, the blood on his head there, that was all individually just, ma I just mask it. I just use my mask tool, and then I go in there and mask out all those little dots. I just draw it out and get happy with it, and then I split it. I split it into its own, and it doesn't have to be... Honestly, if this was for production, I would save out a version where uh, it's one solid model without any of the splits, and then I go and make a new model. That's the beauty of computers. You know, you save model after model and then call it KS or something for the Keyshot version where I split everything and have all my subtools. Because one thing in Keyshot, if you don't split everything up and you have it all in one subtool, it's, you, and you try to assign colors within Keyshot, you're going to end up just one solid. You know, if I went with flesh, he's going to be naked. You know, is what it is. Um, but that's kind of what I, you know, there's me breaking up symmetry, uh, learning how to change my process here, you know. Not really happy with the eyes, but, you know, it was a work in progress, and it was something I was doing. You know. <laughs> yeah, Ron Burgundy, um, uh, you know. So, that's kind of my process on these guys, these little, little guys. Yeah, Rufi. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Enough fans in here know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Everybody's doing their little take on, like I said, Stranger Things. And for me, the, 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 the joys of working digital is you can work with speed. You know, these bikes here, I made one bike, and I made two sets of handlebars and uh, changed some things up. And then actually two of the guys here have the same jacket. I just modified them slightly, and I can quickly speed sculpt through my designs and what I want, you know. Obviously, if it was for a client, I would tweak things and change them to their... A bit, you know, but I'm doing it for myself, so I was happy with that. Yeah. This is the same exact body, you know, same body, different heads. Two brothers, different mothers, you know, switch them around. <laughs> so I got, I, you know, I, I was able to quickly crank through that because I only had to do two heads on that, you know, another Heisenberg. And there we go with Wayne's World, you know. Fun characters, fun things to do if you're a, a fan of TV shows and stuff like that. And, you know, the sincerest compliment is when you, you post something like that and, the, and, you know, one of the actual actors come in there and they're like, hey, man, I dig that, you know, and they send you a little tweet or post on something, you know, you never know. And that's always fun when you get a, a compliment like that. So that leads me into what I did there with the criblets. Let's get back into ZBrush really quickly because I know, uh, how are we on time? If they're... We're good? I was going to say, if there's any questions anybody has, they are more than welcome to yell them out, and I will listen to your questions. I don't know if you know this guy. He's got, like, big, big head, you know. But this is, this is what I do. It's more of a stylized approach. 
See the sweepiness there? Underneath, doesn't matter, it's solid, but it's, it's chunky, that would be cleaned out. If it was for production, you know, um, over when it gets sent overseas, a lot of that stuff will be cleaned up on their end. You know, there are some people that are very, very, very uptight about it, and, you know, sometimes I would have to go and clean that up and have a certain wall thickness, you know, in relationship with the uh, torso and all of that. But for me, for what I was doing, this is okay. Okay, now I'm going to show you how I kind of break things up. Right now, you can see in my subtool list, I have four different items. Um, what I do a lot is I will turn on my poly paint, but yeah, yeah, you see it's Dynamesh. I Dynamesh a lot, and, and that's okay. Especially when I'm doing all, all these hairs were individual though. I kind of, you know, and I made myself a, 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 a special tool with the hairs, brought them all in, and then, then I finally go in there and Dynamesh it down, bring it down, and smooth things out. So that, that's kind of how I get that. Uh, but say I wanted to color Chewbacca. Right now, what you see with the poly, with the poly frame that's what I'm going to get, just one solid brown. Back in the day, one solid brown would do. But for now, we got multiple washes and stuff on toys. So what I like to do, and you all know the mass by cavity where it kind of goes in there. I'm going to hit it real quick. You see what it does. Mass by cavity hits all that inside area, the cavity, uh, and you get those nice little lines there. What I like to do with my style on these is go down one more to mass by smoothness. Right now, it's one. 40, 142, that's fine. I'm just, I'm gonna hit it and look at that, you know? I got, right now I got these nice little, uh, it, it just kind of reads well on those surfaces and hits all those edges right, you know? And I could go in there, clean it up, sharpen it, blur it, uh, redefine it, but for the sake of speed, I'm just gonna hit group mask. It's kind of hard to see what I just did there because the colors are too similar, so don't look at this. Real quick, I'm gonna change it to a different color that reads a little better. It's opposite from what I have. There we go. You didn't see that. Okay. So now I got this Chewbacca that looks like it should be on a um, black light poster. Uh, but uh, you, you see it's broken into two different um, colors there, and, but it's still within the same subtool. I set up my custom UI for speed and efficiency a lot of times, and I will go in there now, and I'm going to just, uh, you know, control shift click on it, and then uh, if I don't have any stupid, it's not stupid, but geometry, <laughs> sub, D, sub D levels, like a, if, I, if I've already gotten rid of those, I'm going to split it. So I split that guy, right? And I have it in two different layers. So now when I drop it into key shot, I'm going to have my main fur area. And I could go in there and relabel and rename these things because the great thing about key shot uh, bridge is when it goes in there, it will say ZBrush in the front of it and whatnot, but it will still recognize the names. So you, you, know, you can use your cherry picker to pick a part, or you can go down your list. Um, but that's a lot of times what I do when I'm splitting those out. Quickly, I'm aware of time. That's my finished Chewbacca. See, what I did was I, I didn't just do one layer, I did it multiple layers, and you know, it's as far as you want to take it, man. You know, you can just keep you can just keep masking after masking, layer after layer, splitting after splitting, but you just got to organize all your stuff. It may seem a little tedious, but honestly, if you work with that workflow, it becomes really quick, really fast, and you can get great results. And honestly, this is another job in the, in the product design um, industry now. It really has become one. Um, these, type of, these type of images you see up here, they're selling points. You can literally... T uh, make a model, I'm, I'm, I'm like half squatted. Um, you can literally make a model now and a company will use it as solicitation. They say, coming soon, you know, it's all about speed uh, in the in product development industry. It's all about speed, it's all about getting things done quickly and efficiently and you can literally take this image and sell it into a company and you're like, wow, I'm gonna get that and in a year's time from now, that's great. Where do I sign? You know, and it's realistic, you know, it, on, honestly, some of these washes might be a little bit much, but if the company comes to you and says, oh, dial that back again, you can do that in Keyshot, dial it back and then literally have what you need at the end of the day. There's him and Mr. Solo. Uh, and there is a picture of him being masked out entirely, and I was just doing a test, looking at it, seeing how he would look fully rendered and, uh, not, not rendered, but masked out. And I'm like, yeah, I kind of like that look. Let's go with it. Um, but that's what I do there. So here we go. I'm going to pull up this one here, which you already kind of saw. Um, we got this Leia here. She's a cutie, cutie little Leia. 
She's really simple and cute. I'm going to go ahead and go into key shot now. Let me see how many tools do I got. Checking out my parts, everything's there. I don't even got to label it at this point, but I'm gonna, the way you get to key shot, since this is also about explaining a little bit about what you do, right? Uh, you go to render, you go down to external renderer, key shot, you hit that button, and then you, uh, sometimes auto merge is turned on. I usually typically turn that off because I didn't, don't work with that. But uh, I hit key shot, and if you buy the bridge, then you go back over to your BPR button, which typically you would hit just to get a nice pass and see how your model looks you know, rendered with the shadows, right? Now it's going to do something different and open up in key shot, which is where we need to be next. Key shot, where you at, where you at? Anybody have any questions or anything? Any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, we got one. Hey. Uh, hey. So once you're in Keyshot, do you ever like see how the light is behaving like on your edges or your surface and then like step back a second um, to like, sort of rework it just based on what you're seeing uh, at the render time? As a render time? Yes, I do sit back. I'll sit back and let it do its thing. So, is that what you're saying? Oh, no, so like, I'm asking like, once you're in Keyshot and you're setting up your lights and stuff, do you ever see something in the model that you're not liking how it reads and then go back to ZBrush to work it again? Yes, yes. And uh, that's, that's the thing. Um, one thing I will show you with the menu is, uh, well, let me find the menu. Huh? Uh, where's my menu? Oh, my menu's just down here. There we go. Okay, so I have all these little, no, that's materials. That's all these little pieces. There we go. Sorry, I'm not used to 6.2, and you, you guys are so fancy and above, you know, always the top. I've been working in six, you know. <laughs> been working in six. So it's okay. I can still get what I need to get done here. Um, what I'm going to do is go over here to import, if I can import it really quickly. And I'm going to go to desktop, ZBrush Summit stuff, that's mine. Material package, that's mine. I'm just going to import my colors real quickly, if I can, if it'll work. Paints, plastics, sorry about that. Hard surface. For the sake of speed, I'm going to do something a little bit differently because I don't know where my, my, my colors went to. But here's one thing. I don't like the particular set of lighting that it brings into the model when I drop it in there. For some people, like I said, this is just fine. But for me, I drag and drop. I get my colors. I would typically go in there and finesse my colors, just uh, checking out. I, what my process of working in here is pretty dumb simple. I know there are a lot of different things you can do and you can actually render something with passes and I've rendered passes and stuff, but for me, I don't really take it, I don't really take it into uh, Photoshop most of the time. If I did, if I needed to, I could. But for my purposes, I usually set up a nice lighting and I get it to where I need it to look and I go from there. Um, this layer is going to be about, different. You got about 10 minutes left. OK, we got 10 minutes. OK, I'm going to crank through this layer here then. We got Leia. She usually don't have black hair, but I'm going to give her black hair today. I'm also going to give her black eyebrows, black suit, and a um, black there. And cool thing is I can also right click on, a, on an actual area uh, uh, that I've already selected, and I can copy the material instead of going to this list of colors, and I can paste it in, right? On her hands, boom. So I got that in there. Um, I'm going to go with this here. Sorry, this is kind of impromptu because uh, I typically had a material list of my own, but it, it's okay. For the purposes of what we're doing, I'm going to speed this up, and I'm going to show you something. So here we go. Let's make these black. Make them shiny black, kind of like her eyes. Copy paste right there, and we're going to go into lighting environment. I'm going to change this to a darker lighting of my own. With lighting, you can go in here and you can change the way it looks. You can change everything about it. You can tweak it to your own liking, your own personal, personal you know, formula. And that's kind of what, what I've done. 
with this. Let me turn around my cameras a little bit on rotation. And now, I mean, I'm going to even go as far as give her a little metallic belt instead because she's daddy's little girl now, right? Instead, so there we go, boom. All right, and in a few minutes, this is going to render into some nice, it, it's quickly, it's quick. It works really quick, and you can see how I was able to get a nice quick presentation just out of ZBrush in a matter of minutes, right? I could actually go in here and, and make another lighting source. Um, say I was to select her hair right here. Let me go to scene. Let me go to hair. And I can actually go in here and duplicate this hair. And now I'm going to take this hair and I'm going to right click again and I'm going to move this piece. This is a cheat. You know, there, there you go. I just made another piece within ZBrush without having to, not ZBrush, within Keyshot, without having to jump back into Keyshot, you know, to quickly te tweak, tweak something. Um, I can take this piece and I can actually assign a lighting source to it. Instead, I could, normally I would set up in a model a sphere in the, up, in the, up in the angle, up in the air somewhere, and the sphere is what I would use as my lighting source, but for this I was like, oh, I forgot. Instead of going back, I can quickly just dial it in, add this, uh, take it off a of lumen, go into wattage, maybe, and yeah, just a yellow. How about a red? How about like some kind of hard red? There we go. So that's kind of, that is showing up right there, but guess what? It's still showing, but I can quickly click on here and change my tool to where it is invisible, show only. Well, more or less, usually I, I pull down a list and then there's a way of clicking off of here and then making it so I don't see this anymore. Um, but that's how I would create a lighting source. You know, I could, I could make this inzi invisible. I can bring it out. I could blow up the light more. Um, but for this purpose, I'm going to just turn it off and kind of just show you the presentation again. Uh, line it up how I want. ISO view, front view, back view. You can quickly snap in there and do what you need to do. But that's kind of in a nutshell of what I do to present these models and toys. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? Uh, Here we go. He's got yes, five sir. minutes left, five so we'll minutes take these questions. questions. There we go. I'll start with Mr. John Mahoney and then Jared Krzyzewski. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. So these are your personal toys. Have any of these been created, 3D printed yet? Or are they have, still in the conceptual? Have they been printed? Or have, have no. they been made? No. Uh, they, these were only my personal designs. Uh -huh. And uh, a lot of them, you know, they're, they're, every once in a while, you know, you do get a, a certain random phantom email from a phantom. It's, it's, it's like in Star Wars where they're wearing a dark veil and they're like, hello, I'm from this company. I want to know how much you would take to, you know, you get, that, you get those requests and stuff like that. But it's, it's what they're wanting to offer and, and stuff like that. But as of yet, uh, a lot of this criblet stuff, it's just exploratory on me. And no, they're not signed to any certain company now. All right, well, uh, good luck. Hopefully, they'll be, they'll be in stores someday. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Why are you not printing them, Brian, is what we want to know. Come on, man. Hello. More money in your pocket. Come on, man. Let's Jared's make these toys. Man. Right? Hey, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, two-parter. One is... Um, no, no two-parter. No, two-parter. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Well, do you ever work with like translucency, or is it because mostly you know things are going to be printed in plastic? So you no, actually, are you, are you talking about translucency in Keyshot? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I do. Okay, I've done a few where I've had I've had spheres. I've had a you know I've I've worked on a, a, a for for a company where I was doing say a Goku for a, you know Dragon Ball Z, and he had this you know the the Kamehameha wave in his hand. Oh, I got to light that bad boy up, and oh, you know same thing with. Uh, Ryu, but you know that's an, another guy. But yeah, you can light them up pretty easy in here and uh, do the. There's different settings in in um, in Keyshot where uh, I could go in there. A lot of times you would do emissive colors on the inside, and you would project from the inside, and you would just kind of turn it down. But the problem is, it's only going to come from the outside, and it's just going to light that sphere up. You know, a lot of times I'll take area light for something else, but it's outside of that. You know, you can also cheat by going underneath it or another area where it bounces off of that area. You know, so you can do a couple of different ones and make them invisible inside there, like a phantom, like it's just invisibility cloak over it, and it works that way. Yeah. And then uh, part two is, do you take requests? Do I take requests? 
Yeah, I've gotten a lot of that. I just, I have so many in my head that I want to do. I got this list, this list, list. You could just roll out on a giant scroll of stuff that I kind of want to do myself. So I do listen. And if somebody has one that's just so amazing that I can't pass it up, then a lot of times you'll see it made. I think you should put like the five up and do a voting system. Who's that? You should put five up that you want to do and do a voting system. And the Ooh. people, whatever one gets the most votes, that's the next one you do. Ooh, see, that would work. That would yeah? Work. I saw another question. Oh, look at the, look at the pressure. <laughs> that would be fun. <laughs> you go vote. Yeah, yeah. Paul could make up a, a little thread and you guys could go vote and then, you know. And in in honor of uh, you know being here or something like that, and you know, I could squeeze in some time to either do a criblet or one of the other ones for everyone. If everybody voted on this certain one, I could do that. Hey, um, I work with uh, toy mechanisms as well, and ZBrush is great for the sculpting. But do you know a way of taking ZBrush into like a more mechanical uh, package like SolidWorks? I'm sorry. Could, is there a way to take your high resolution model? that's in ZBrush yeah. into SolidWorks, because you can go the other way. You can go... Uh, you can take it from SolidWorks into, into ZBrush, which is really easy. But yeah. to, to go the other way, I, I don't really go know. Go the other way into KeyShot or go the oh. other way? To so SolidWorks. To SolidWorks. SolidWorks, that's more of a question. Look at him, he's like, I know that. I really wouldn't know the answer yeah, to that. He wants to go from ZBrush to SolidWorks, so... Yeah, uh, yeah. To make like a... a, a yeah, yeah cause he needs, cause you get, it's gotta be converted back to a NURB system. Nerve base with curves. Yeah. So it is possible. There's companies out there that do conversions for you. Uh, one of them is Integrity Wear. There's, you can actually buy a software by them. It's called uh, Cyborg 3D. Mm -hmm. You actually take the ZBrush models in and convert them. You can save that iGest and Steps files as well. Yeah. All yeah. for you. So you can go that way back into SolidWorks. Because yeah. uh, R, you decimate it, and then you got to import through polygons into SolidWorks, and then yeah. now redo a conversion. But I don't think SolidWorks has any conversion, though, for that, yeah. as far as I know. So you'd have to use another company's software. Yeah. So I've I've had to in the past use other softwares to make a sol solids. You're talking solid state, bring it in and then uh, actually converting it. I, I know in in freeform I can do some of those type of of things to get somebody to be able to bring it into SolidWorks. So I've done that in the past, but not really with the ZBrush at the time. Any last question before we let Brian go? Oh, there it is. Uh, he gets to go sit in the back with Mr. Louis Leather Jacket Tucci. Oh my God, what did I just knock over? A body? Sorry. You're good. Sorry, God, I thought I kicked like my child there for a minute. I'm sorry about that. Where, where did it go? Right here. Hey, this is just more of a uh, comment, but I just wanted to say I really appreciate the uh, inspirational section of your whole first part, it was just awesome to. Uh, connect to everybody as an artist and a geek and a gamer, and it's super inspiring. So well, thank thanks you. for that. Thank you. you know, dude, we're, we're all in this together, you know, and, and making stuff, and we all have literally the same type of things, you know, it's like one of us, one of us. It really is. It really is one of those type of moments with what we do, so I figured I'd bring that up. You know, thank you. Thank you. That's another thing uh, that I was going to end with in here. I have one image to show, and I, I can close it out. There, there, happy little trees. <laughs> this guy here, yeah. who you might have seen out there, right there. Yeah. And uh, you almost made me forgot about this. You know, I, I, I'm wearing this shirt for a reason. You know, and growing up as a kid, you know, a lot of us would just sit there and just be like, wow, look at that. He's making something out of nothing. He's constantly making something out of nothing. He's like, well, I'll do this. Oh, never mind about that. I'll change it into this. You know, and he, it was so, you know, he's got that soothing voice too. But I just used to love hearing him do it stuff. And it's still a piece. And it's on Netflix right now. You can go in there and stream it. And you can work on your Cintiq to the side or whatever, your, your laptop, whatever. You can be doing that and be at peace. So... No mistakes. There are no mistakes with what we do, you know? Uh, just happy accidents. And I, I love that quote, and I live by that. So thank you. And thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> uh. I've just decided that's now the slogan of ZBrush Summit. Nothing happens. It's not a mistake. It's a happy accident. That's right. And maybe next year we'll come in with wigs. <laughs> Alrighty.
All right, so ladies and gentlemen, Brian Beatty, amazing job. Thank you, Hi. sir, for being here. Thank you.